Uh, good morning uh, and, and welcome to the 24th meeting in 2018 with the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, as usual, can I ask members uh, and any other people who are here to put their mobile phones on to silent? Um, the only item on their agenda today is to take evidence on the operation of Scotland's fiscal framework with Liz Truss MP, who is the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. Um, Ms Truss is joined by Lindsay White, the Director of Personal Tax, Welfare and Pensions at HM Treasury, and Chris, Chris Maxted, who is the Devolution Spending Principal in the Treasury. Um, we are quite tight for time today because Chief Secretary has to be, um, is only available till 10.30, so if we can keep our questions short and snappy, that would be helpful. Uh, but before we go to questions um, from the committee, can I invite the Chief Secretary, if she so wishes, to make an opening statement, and can I say we might very much appreciate her appearance before the committee today. Well, thank you very much, convener, and it's great to be here uh, in the main chamber of the Scottish Parliament uh, talking to the committee. I think this is the ideal time to be talking about Scotland's fiscal framework. It's now 2.5 years since the Scotland Act 2016 reached royal assent, and that was the time at which the fiscal framework was agreed. Around one third of the Scottish Government's budget is now determined by receipts raised in Scotland, and that will rise to more than 50% once the Scotland Act 2016 is implemented in full. This means that the Scottish Government has far more autonomy to vary the level of tax and spending in Scotland. What devolution of tax powers means is more accountability for how they are used and also responsibility for how they are used. And the arrangements that were agreed within the fiscal framework mean the Scottish Government budget position is much more closely linked to decisions that are made here on how to grow the Scottish economy. And with the devolution of tax powers comes accountability for how those powers are used and the responsibility for managing their effects. Of course, the Scottish Government also has the advantages of being part of a wider macroeconomic system. We agreed in the fiscal framework that UK-wide macroeconomic risks were best managed at a UK-wide level. And, of course, Treasury Ministers have a vital role in the stewardship of the Scottish economy in areas that are not devolved to the Scottish Parliament. I would point out there's been some real success in the Scottish economy in recent years. 61,000 more, more businesses since 2010 and nearly 200,000 more people in employment. And the Treasury will continue to share the benefits of the Union across Scotland in all its work, from its tax policy on oil and gas to the ongoing programme of city deals. Of course, there are various complexities in the fiscal framework and the process of implementing it continues. Uh, two and a half years later, we're beginning to see some of the impacts of tax devolution, particularly as forecasts become outturn. But I very much recognise that this is new territory and the UK government is keen to support understanding of the implications of fiscal de devolution and its contingent risks. And we continue in our dialogue with the Scottish Government on that. Yesterday I met uh, Derek Mackay uh, to discuss this in some detail. There are occasionally complexities and issues to resolve, but I would e echo the comments of Derek Mackay when he was here in May. The UK Government is committed to working in partnership with the Scottish Government to make sure fiscal devolution operates as it was intended uh, in the recommendations of the Smith Commission. And I'm very pleased to be here today to take any questions and further that discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Secretary. That's a very helpful uh, opening. Um, we took some very interesting evidence yesterday from a range of people on the fiscal framework and its operations so far. And I'm sure the Chief Secretary is aware that income tax powers between the UK government and the Scottish government operate in a much more uh, of a shared space than they had previously. Therefore, the decisions taken by one government can impact on the tax raised by another, but particularly in regard to income tax raised in Scotland. For example, decisions about corporation tax might drive decisions by higher income self-employed earners about how much or how little profit they take as income, or a reduction in corporation tax might encourage a greater level of, co of incorporation. And that could result in an unintentional impact on the level of income tax take in Scotland. Uh, and, and under the fiscal framework, uh, in these circumstances, the Scottish budget bears the risk. 
I could give some other examples, but I think that's a, a reasonable example. Given that type of potential outcome, I'd be interested to learn the extent to which the, Her Majesty's Treasury shares this information about their budget proposals um, before they're announced, and vice versa, um, so that both sides can have a assess just what the likely impact might be on each other's government's tax date. Now, I know that's a, that can be a difficult space for, for governments to be involved in, but it would also uh, enhance some of that partnership you talked about in your opening statement. So I think there's, a, there's a, t a potential tension there. We need to understand that both governments are talking to each other about their proposals. So I don't know what sort of reaction you have to that. Well, first of all, uh, the overall structure of the fiscal framework was decided as part of the Smith Commission, which was, a, of course, an independent uh, commission looking into these issues. And those issues were considered at the time. And I think it's important to recognise that the package that was agreed was a package and did recognise some of these complexities. So the interaction between the Scottish economy and the broader UK economy, the amount of levers the Scottish government has to influence policy versus the levers the UK government has to influence policy. So that's not just fiscal policy. It could also be policy on areas like housing, like skills, that have an influence on businesses and the economy. So the, those issues were taken into account. And we are, as I said, two and a half years into the fiscal framework. We're beginning to see the impact of income tax devolution. But I do... I believe that this is a good period to be looking at how it's working and making sure the mechanics are correct. And of course, we will have the review of the fiscal framework come 2021. Uh, just on the point you make about budgets, of course, quite a lot of the measures we announce in budgets are consultations precisely for that reason, to give the opportunity for businesses across the UK to comment on those uh, budget measures, but also for dialogue with the devolved administration. And one of the things that I discussed in my meeting yesterday with Derek Mackay was how we can work closely together on the whole area of economic growth. Uh, what drives economic growth? How can we make sure that our policies are aligned? I mean, one of the reasons, of course, for not devolving corporation tax is the potential of tax competition and cross-border competition. But at the same time, Scotland does need the freedom to pursue policies in various areas, and that's the whole purpose of further fiscal devolution. So I think we got to the right balance uh, as a result of the Smith Commission, but I think that regular dialogue is very important. And I very much see my role as the Treasury Minister responsible for this area to have a strong interest in Scottish economic growth and make sure that I am maintaining that regular dialogue with, with Derek Mackay. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, let me just press you just a little bit further on that. We, we, uh, corporation tax, while it remains obviously a, a, a reserve matter, um, does the Treasury recognise, though, if there's a change to corporation tax, or it could be personal allowances, it could be other areas, that there is a potential for the income tax take in Scotland to be either increased or reduced in these circumstances? And, and do they take that into consideration as part of their pre-budget planning? Well, what I would say there is that there are policies that can be pursued on either side of the border that are going to have an impact on income tax policy. Uh, and that is, you know, these are two very, very interconnected economies. So I do recognise there is an impact. Okay. I don't know if, Lindsay, you want to say any more about that. Thank you. So in developing tax policies for the UK budget, we do take into account a whole range of impacts and we engage with a whole range of stakeholders, including from Scotland, I think the other thing that I would just add, um, as the Chief Secretary said, the fiscal framework does anticipate that some policy changes by either government might have a direct impact on tax receipts or sort of welfare spending of the other. 
and there is a, a process um, where we can either government can raise those issues um, so that they're then sort of jointly analysed and they will be brought to the Joint Exchequer Committee um, between the Chief Secretary and Derek Mackay to work through any resolution that needs to be put in place. Well, I, I, I hope that framework can be robust as it sounds, um, but you know, the rabbits out of a hat and budgets are a common, ex can, can be a, an experience we're all aware of and sometimes these surprises come along that no, nobody has been consulted about or indeed governments know, and I know that's about political choice, um, but I'm just making sure that people are aware about the potential impact on the Scottish budget. I, I was, you want to, are you, is a supplementary to that? I'm, I'm confident that that's a supplementary, um, given that the, that the Chief uh, Secretary of Treasury has spoke about, you know, uh, how we're beginning to see the impact um, of uh, income tax devolution, and that there's an acknowledgement that, you know, different policy choices, you know, can have, you know, a, a, an impact, uh, you know, on, on either side of the, the, the border. Um, but I, I would be interested in your views about how you know, if you can envisage arguments for more coherent packages um, of, of power. So, for example, uh, Scottish Parliament has the power to set rates and bans uh, for income tax. There is a divergence in income tax policy uh, between uh, the two governments. And I wondered if you've seen any arguments um, in favour of the Scottish Parliament also uh, being able to legislate for income tax reliefs and personal allowances. The convener uh, touched upon that, and you know, if not, why not? It's a, an issue that we bump up against a lot as a, a committee about, you know, how, how could things just be um, more more coherent and actually make more sense at a, a practical level? I mean, this is part of the discussion that took place. My understanding is during the Smith Commission discussions exactly where does the line get drawn and I think the important point about the personal allowance is it's linked to all kinds of benefits so there are issues in and that this was discussed in the context of the Smith Commission we got to the position that we got to we're now essentially seeing how that works over the period of the next few years and then there will be a review of the framework overall and I think that's the right approach and I think it's quite difficult to dis disintegrate different parts of that package because ultimately what the fiscal framework is about is it's about the Scottish government taking on more responsibility for tax raising but also essentially taking on more of the variability in terms of tax revenues and you know, if you change one part of that you have to look at the whole package and I think where the Smith Commission got to was a reasonable place you know, is it is it a complex system yes it's inherently complex because uh, you know, these are two very integrated economies uh, the UK government retains responsibility for the macroeconomic environment and the line has to be drawn at some point so I'm not sure the line can be drawn anywhere where it would be completely clean and you could say here is the here is the pure impact of what the Scottish government is doing and here is the pure impact of what the UK government is doing I think it's also worth recognizing that you know, as a UK Treasury when we do our budgets you know, we, we see vastly fluctuating forecasts from the OBR. A lot of our budget setting is influenced by international factors. So it could be something that is done in the European Union. It could be you know, actions taken by the US on trade, uh, you know, the state of the Chinese economy. There are, so trying to separate out these different impacts is, is very difficult. I think where we've got to is a workable framework uh, that that so far has proved effective. I think, of course, when we get to the, the review period, we should look at the details of precisely how that operates. But it's not set in tablets of stone, given that we're now beginning with the passage of time to understand more about the impacts 
you know, do you have any sense of where the flexibility is to, you know, improve uh, the mechanics and workings of the fiscal framework? But, but my feeling is that we haven't yet got the full mechanics in place. So, for example, on VAT assignment, that has not yet been done. Uh, no doubt we'll come on to that later in the committee. We've just at the position of getting the first outturns on income tax. So we are at early days in terms of where we are. And I think we need to let it all bed down to have a proper view of the operation before the review takes place. Adam. Good morning, Chief Secretary. Um, and you, you may not be aware that two members of this committee were members of the Smith Commission, and um, the two of us might not agree on. That, yes, indeed, and the, we might not, we might the two of us might not agree on everything, but I think we probably are agreed that we don't want to reopen that 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 whole discussion. Um, certainly, I don't. Um, uh, I wanted to pick up a theme that was um, introduced by the convener, um, Chief Secretary, and it's a, it's a theme that the Prime Minister has referred to as a tendency in Whitehall to devolve and forget. Those are her words. Taxation on income as a result of the Smith Commission package in the Scotland Act 2016 is a shared responsibility between the United Kingdom government and the Scottish government. It's neither exclusively reserved nor is it exclusively devolved. Um, so how does the Treasury ensure that in the exercise of these shared responsibilities, um, neither officials nor ministers in the Treasury um, forget about the bits of taxation on income that have been devolved. What, what steps have you taken inside the Treasury to ensure um, that the organization um, understands um, uh, that uh, this is a responsibility, a very significant responsibility that it, as far as Scotland is concerned, now shares with the Scottish Government? I think that's a, a fair point that the Prime Minister made in the past. I certainly don't think it reflects the way the Treasury operates now. Uh, that we do take our responsibilities very seriously in terms of that taxation coordination. Uh, my colleague Mel Stride is overall responsible for the taxation framework, so I know he has uh, discussions with Derek Mackay, as do I. And of course, Lindsay coordinates from an official point of view, so maybe, Lindsay, you could say a bit more about that. Yes, thank you. So we do take this very seriously um, as officials within the Treasury. Um, we have a standing devolution, devolution team, of which Chris is a member, which um, provides a central role and runs a capability building sort of approach to make sure that all of the tax and welfare teams across the Treasury fully understand um, the changes in the devolution settlement and the underpinning financial arrangements so that we're making sure that we are taking into account the new structures in the way that we're developing tax policy. And we do that through sort of training programs and um, looking to embed devolution very clearly through the structures and processes that we run um, for the budget. Um, beyond that, that is part of a wider civil service approach actually, where we work in partnership with um, officials from all of the um, governments and the devolved administrations to make sure that the whole of the civil service, the civil service is focused on building devolution capability as well. And, and, and how, how much of that structure is quadrilateral in terms of the UK thinking about you know, all three devolved um, nations um, and, and how much of it is bilateral and specific to Scotland? Uh, so it's a combination of both. There is a, um, from the Treasury perspective, a finance minister's quadrilateral process that involves all of the devolved administrations. And then we have bilateral processes. So in the case of Scotland, that is the Joint Exchequer Committee, which is the Chief Secretary and Derek Mackay. And that's supported by an officials process, as well as a number of working groups underneath that, which deal with the different elements of the devolution framework and the fiscal framework. Thank you. Angela, I realise you wanted to come another supplementary. I'm just conscious of my time here. I've got to half past. If I've got space later, we'll come back. Um, Alex, you wanted to cover issues of reconciliation, I think. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, Chief Secretary. Um, uh, a critical element of this committee's pre-budget scrutiny is to examine the impact of a reconciliation process uh, on the subsequent Scottish budget. Um, can you just confirm that the reconciliation figure for the block grant adjustment following the publication of audited outturn figures for the 1718 income, Scottish income tax will be published by Her Majesty's Treasury by September 2019. Uh, and as a sort of supplementary to that, yesterday at committee, <coughs> um, yeah, it became clear that the three-year lag in this process uh, had, you know, presents its own issues. 
Um, I just wondered if you have any views as to how we could uh, improve uh, this process, uh, either through frequency of the re reconciliations or by maybe introducing interim uh, reconciliations. Maybe Lindsay could cover the exact date and then I can answer the question about the lag. So I believe that um, published figures for reconciliation um, in relation to stamp duty and landfill tax have been published for this autumn budget. Um, HMRC are responsible for outturn figures and then Treasury will continue the process of transparency around the block grant adjustments and reconciliation process um, for income tax and then uh, also for VAT assignment once that comes into play. I mean, on the subject of the lag, essentially, in the forecasting versus outturn issue, HMRC share all the data they have with the Scottish Government, so they have the latest data. I think the issue with income tax is whilst PAYE data comes in relatively quickly, self-assessment data does take time to come through the system, and that's exactly the same issue we face from an overall UK budget point of view, is that there is a lag in the system before the income tax returns catch up. So this is why uh, additional buffer has been provided to the Scottish Government to manage those timing differences that between the you know, forecast and the outturn being received. Don, you wanted to cover areas of reserves and drawdown and obviously its relationship to forecasting and some of the risks and, that we bear. Indeed, Convener. Thank you and good morning, Chief Secretary. My, my question per pertains more generally to flexibility. Um, we have, as things currently stand, um, an option of a £250 million drawdown from the reserve. The Scottish Government is required to set a balanced budget, but the fiscal framework was conceived in the pre-Brexit era. We now live in an era where the respected Fraser of Allender Institute forecasts the loss of between 30 and 80,000 jobs as a consequence of Brexit. And the Governor of the Bank of England suggests that house prices could fall by up to a third in the event of a no-deal Brexit. In this post-Brexit era, is the fiscal framework as flexible as it needs to be to give the Scottish Government the maximum scope for managing any volatility? Well, what, what I would say is, first of all, we are confident we can secure a deal. There's a meeting of the Cabinet earlier this week discussing this very issue, and we are very positive about the opportunity to secure that deal, which will achieve, amongst other things, frictionless trade. So what the Bank of England Governor uh, was talking about is making sure that the system is prepared for all eventualities. In no way is that the most likely eventuality. And I think it's very important to recognise that those negotiations and that deal that would result in frictionless trade would not see the types of impacts that you're, you're talking about. Uh, in terms of... If I could just, if I just finish on the the point you make about flexibility. There is the 300 million buffer to deal with timing issues. There is the access to uh, the Scottish Reserve, as you've pointed out. And I think one of the, when the income tax devolution started, one of the issues was making sure that the forecasting was in line with outturn. That was probably the biggest change because we didn't have the data uh, no one had the data on exactly which, which people were Scottish taxpayers. That data is now much clearer. So I think the, bi the biggest change we've seen in the difference between forecast and actual has already occurred. And as, you, as you're aware, there are specific provisions for a Scotland-specific economic shock, which would give the Scottish government recourse to additional buffers in the system. So if there is a Scottish specific economic shock, there is additional uh, buffer room. And if there was a UK wide economic shock for whatever reason, the fiscal framework, because of the way it's been set up, effectively means that if there's a reduction in UK wide tax revenues and a reduction in Scotch revenues, 
that will be accounted for within the block grant adjustment. So in the case of a Scotland-specific economic shock, that's covered by additional buffer. In the case of a UK-wide economic shock, that, that works through the block grant adjustment system. And you're entirely confident that whatever eventualities come from the, the Brexit negotiations, that the overall flexibility that exists within the fiscal framework will meet the requirements of the Scottish Government. You have no concerns at all regarding flexibility. That's right, yes. Okay. Can, can I just pressure on that bit, yes. Chief Secretary? I know it's hard to forget about Brexit, but can we just park that for a minute and just look at the, the implications of forecast error alone mm -hmm. in terms of the potential impact on the Scottish budget? Um, because some of the most recent figures for 1819 that were set as a sort of base year, and because of forecast error would have shown already, um, there had been a £389 million impact on the Scottish budget. And yet, if you use the drawdown and the Scottish, or from the Scottish Reserve and the utilising the borrowing powers, there's only £520 million in there. <coughs> And that's if, if there's no shock. So in normal circumstances, with, even with forecast error, we're up against the buffers in terms of flexibility. And I think it's something that both the Scottish Government and the Treasury need to have a look at. Hmm. I mean, the setup of the fiscal framework is such, though, that if revenues... I mean, I, I agree with you about the forecasting issue, and there clearly were issues in the, the initial forecast, which have now been sorted out through the outturn process. But one of the whole purposes of the fiscal framework is, is the Scottish Government taking more revenue risk. So if tax income isn't what was anticipated, then that means that spending or alternatively adjustments to tax rates have to take place. So the yes, there's the timing issue, which the buffer is designed to address. And we've seen the buffer absolutely capable of addressing any timing issues that have thus far been identified. But on the broader issue, the whole purpose of the work of the Smith Commission was that more revenue risk is held by the Scottish Government, and that would necessitate in exactly the same way as you know, if we have a forecast from the OBR at a UK budget that you know, doesn't bring in the tax revenues expected, we have to we have to adjust our budget accordingly. Yeah, but this is a, an implication of no decisions taken either by the UK government or the Scottish government it relates entirely to forecast errors between the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the OBR, and that would have resulted without any policy changes, without anything else, just forecast error would have resulted in us in, in that base year of being 389 million down. And if that had been the reality of the first year of going live, we'd have been up against the buffers of the, the, um, the, the reserve and the borrowing powers and that flexibility exists. I think there is an issue in there that needs to be looked at by both governments. I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to come on on that. Thank you. So I think it's important to be clear that I, the number which I believe you're referring to is still a forecast number, so that will not be reconciled in the block grant adjustment until we have the outturn for income tax in 2019, um, and it's for it's uh, for that reason that we, it's for the reason that HMRC um, collect taxes for Scottish income that we don't do the Scottish government doesn't itself have the flexibility to manage that in year, so we don't do in year reconciliations ahead of the outturn. Um, of course, those forecast figures might move again before we do the reconciliation, as the chief secretary. Um, has alluded to earlier on, the Scottish Government have powers which, uh, which they can use between now and the reconciliation to help to manage that. And then in the event that there does end up being a forecast um, uh, impact on the Scottish budget at the time we do reconciliation, then there are the borrowing powers that the Chief Secretary has alluded to as well. Okay. Um, I think I've probably got as far as I can with that one. Sorry to labour it a bit. Um, sorry, we move on to, I think, um, VAT now. And uh, James, I think you were interested in that, right? Y yes, I certainly was. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, Chief Secretary. In terms of the uh, assignment of VAT, uh, obviously 
uh, this, the, this is a, a body of work that's undergoing and a bit like the income tax uh, position, um, there's going to be a forecast of VAT assignment um, carried out. So I just wondered if you can give some detail on the work that's been undertaken with regards to the methodology uh, for that, that forecast and how robust it is. Well, thank you. And um, the VAT assignment was agreed as part of the Smith Commission and the fiscal framework. It was agreed that it would be a methodology. Uh, and since then, we have been working with the Scottish Government on that methodology. We'll shortly be publishing uh, that proposed methodology. It's essentially based on the work we already do when we report the VAT gap, for example, to the European Union. Uh, so it's a robust methodology. Uh, it's also used internationally. So example, uh, the way that uh, value added taxes divvied up between the Canadian provinces uh, is another example of this methodology being used. So we think it's a uh, very robust methodology that's used extensively internationally. Uh, we've been working with the Scottish Government. I believe we're in agreement. I had that discussion with Derek Mackay yesterday, so we'll be ready to publish it very soon. So, I don't know, so Lindsay, if you want to give more details on the precise methodology. Yes, I can. So the, the assignment model looks at expenditure in Scotland compared to the UK, and it then works out an attributed VAT share for Scotland. And the reason we have to do that is that in that um, businesses don't currently have to disaggregate their VAT return by uh, geographic um, by geographic area. Um, so we are using independent expenditure data from the ONS and both governments have agreed to commission an enhanced uh, survey from the ONS to improve the data, um, which will be available then through the implementation period. That model's been developed by experts in HMRC working very closely with the Treasury and with Scottish Government officials. So as the, as the Chief Secretary says, it's been um, de developed in very close cooperation and it will be jointly published by both governments shortly. Okay, a couple of follow-up questions. The, the first, I understand the first forecasts uh, are going to be produced later this year. Is that still the case? The methodology is going to be produced shortly rather than the forecast, I think. Is that right? We will, ha we will have um, okay, initial right. forecasts this year. So at the um, autumn budget, uh, the OBR will do a forecast for our UK VAT. And shortly afterwards for the Scottish budget, the Scottish Fiscal Commission will forecast Scottish VAT receipts to inform the implementation year. Forecast use this uh, new methodology that's been developed. Well, okay. Um, and, and then just in terms of this issue of, with disaggregating the, the, the Scottish level of VAT, that's not done currently. So how is that going to be worked out going forward? Because obviously that's crucial, not just to establishing the forecast, but to, to making sure that the, the actual VAT uh, figures are correct. So that's why we've developed the expenditure model and the attributed share for Scotland. Um, so that's the, that's the methodology that is sort of internationally recognised, as the Chief Secretary has said, rather than putting a significant cost on businesses to disaggregate it themselves through their VAT returns. So, so Sorry, I'm just not absolutely clear on that. So that, that is in terms of the forecast. So for the outturn, we essentially attribute uh, a certain amount of VAT to... Scotland using, for example, sales data, essentially. So what we don't do is we don't ask every single business to report was that good sold in England or Scotland. Uh, it's a model that we're using to calculate it, and that is internationally recognised. It's already used, as I mentioned, in Canada to separate out VAT between the provinces. It's used in terms of what we, we report to the EU on our VAT gap. So uh, essentially it is an estimate. Well, it's a, it's a model. Yeah, it, it's but an does estimate. It track, does it track every single good and attribute it to a particular country? No, it doesn't. 
Right, okay. Uh, just, to f just to follow that point up, Mayor, it, it's not, however, based on reconciliation of actual receipts. It's based on survey data that I think your colleague mentioned. Is that correct? The other, the other taxes that are devolved are based on the adjustments that were made in reconciliation of real receipts, but this isn't. That is right. It is a model to attribute the VAT to Scotland. It is not a... It is not the actual receipts from the goods sold. That so it's a different it's a different process of outturn and reconciliation from income tax, where as an income tax we're tracking individual taxpayers. Do do you see perhaps moving towards proper re reconciliation based on receipts when we get the time and the opportunity? It would be an incredible burden on business, I think, to yeah. ask for every single item that is sold to be attributed to Scotland or other parts of the UK. Okay, okay. And I think it's important to recognise that that was agreed as part of the Smith Commission and the fiscal framework, that there would be a model developed and a methodology. And what we're doing shortly is publishing that methodology. So the, the, the principle that we would have a methodology to attribute that VAT was established as part of the fiscal framework. The precise details of the methodology are the model that we're shortly about to release, which the committee, of course, will be able to comment on, uh, along with everybody else. Ask, um, during the Smith Commission, there was some discussion about the full transfer of VAT uh, powers and rates to, to Scotland, but that was ruled out, as I understand, by one of your predecessors, Mr Gawke, on EU directives about different VAT routes, rates within member states uh, now that we're potentially in a different situation post brexit is that something that the government might be willing to revisit at some future date i mean my, my view is we've already got a lot on our plate with implementing the existing smith commission proposals and the fiscal framework and making sure that works so i think we should focus on doing that now it's also important to recognize that in terms of VAT, the Scottish Government does have significant levers over the amount of VAT generated in Scotland. You know, it's very intimately connected with economic growth. I mentioned areas of policy such as housing policy, skills policy, planning policy. All of those things will affect VAT take. So I think we've got the right balance. Uh, I think the important thing is to, first of all, get it done, so implement it properly. And you know, we've agreed with the Scottish Government the timelines uh, for implementing uh, VAT devolution. And I also think it's important to be able to explain the principles uh, as clearly as possible to, uh, to the public. But would you be willing to, would you rule it out at any future stage after it's bedded in? And no, no parliament can bind its successor. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Emma, I think you'd issues of VAT as well. Actually, uh, Willie Coffey kind of covered that, so I'm okay, thanks. Okay, um, in that case, I think it was Neil who had issues around APD. Neil? Chief Secretary, um, the de devolution of air passenger duty has been delayed, uh, agreed by the Scottish Government and UK Government uh, last year. Can I ask you what progress, one of the key issues that has for that delay was around the exemption for, or lack of exemption for Highlands and Islands passengers. Can I ask you what progress has been made to address those concerns around the exemptions for Highland and Islands uh, flights? And could you give us an indication of when you think air passenger duty is likely to be devolved? Well, you're absolutely right. That is the critical issue on air passenger duty is the Highlands and Islands exemption. I think the, the issue is, in terms of the Scottish Government exiting the existing APD arrangements and establishing a new tax, uh, is the potential for that Highlands and Islands exemption not to fulfil state aid requirements. Uh, what we have said as part of the EU deal uh, that we put on the table is we want to continue to be part of a state aid regime. We think it's very important in terms of competition policy going forward 
that the UK has a robust state aid regime. I mean, we are working with the Scottish Government. We've, we've offered to help, I think, in terms of approaching the European Union, but I don't believe that we have currently been asked to do that uh, on their behalf. I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to say a bit more on that. Yes, that's... That's right. So, as I understand it, the um, Scottish Government are running a series of workshops um, with a, um, a whole range of stakeholders to explore the options that they have for the design of their new tax, um, with a view to ensuring that it can be compliant with the new EU guidance for a new tax. Um, and we will continue to work with them and engage with them um, as we develop the, um, the forward framework for the UK as well. Just, just to clarify, you said that the Scottish Government haven't asked the UK Government to approach the European Union Commission? No. And I think you know, it is the Scottish Government that is developing this new tax. And I know that Derek Mackay appeared in front of the committee very recently uh, to discuss the overall fiscal framework. But we, you know, we have offered to assist and are working with the Scottish Government, but ultimately uh, the, the solution does have to come as part of developing that new tax. Okay. Um, in which case we'll go to Patrick. Oh, sorry, the, the, it's difficult when, in this particular format, Murdo, to see who's all went in, so forgive me. On you go. Thank, thank you, Convener. I, I wonder if I could just come in with a, a follow-up to the, the question from, from, from Neil Bibby on um, APD. Have, have the Treasury suggested to the Scottish Government other possible workarounds that would allow APD to be devolved whilst protecting the, the Highlands and Islands discount? Did some ideas, is that correct? But ultimately it is a Scottish Government yeah. responsibility, so there's a limited amount we can do. Yeah, so we are continuing to offer any support um, working with Scottish Government colleagues to develop the options, uh, both, both Treasury and HMRC. Sorry, um, Patrick. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning. Uh, on that last point, perhaps the, the real explanation is that the Scottish Government just isn't that keen to implement a policy that will make its own budget process that bit mu much more difficult. Um, moving on, I wonder if I could ask you to think a few years ahead toward the review process for the framework. You've mentioned it a couple of times, and I'm obviously aware that you wouldn't want to be drawn at the moment on what the outcomes of that review would be. It's, it's too soon to speculate, but the, the, the UK government, and indeed both governments, must have given some thought to the process for that review, for how it should happen, uh, for the ways in which it needs to open up debate and dialogue, not just between the governments, but also involving parliamentary scrutiny, remembering the fact that 2021 is an election year here, uh, and hopefully involving public scrutiny as well. Do you have any thoughts on the process uh, that should be designed to, to take that review forward? We haven't yet considered the process design. I mean, my focus has been implementing the existing arrangements and making sure that we have a good working relationship with the Scottish Government in terms of overall economic coordination. I think it's probably too early uh, to set out the details of that at this stage. I think it's more important to make sure the policy works. My point is there is a review uh, in due course, but when we're at early stages really in implementation, I don't think that's the right time. Can I suggest that there would be some advantage in, in starting to think about that now partly in relation to the public understanding of how the framework works. You know, we are in a period where there are some fairly major disagreements between the two governments uh, and quite a polarised political climate more generally uh, where these kind of disagreements can you know, snowball quite easily. Um, surely a process that tries to build greater public understanding of how this quite complex system works and an assurance uh, that when it's reviewed, it will be done in an open, participative way, uh, surely that would help to, uh, uh, to address some of the confusions, some of the lack of understanding that exists in how the framework operates? Well, first of all, I wouldn't entirely agree with your characterisation of the relationship between the two governments. I think we've got a positive working relationship. There's a very good official uh, relationship between the Treasury and the Scottish Government. 
in implementing what, what is a complex uh, settlement on various issues. So I don't, I don't agree with the, uh, the contention that you know, there isn't that dialogue taking place. And I think from a public point of view, I think explaining the current uh, arrangements is more important than talking about the future uh, the future review at this stage. I think that's what will give the public confidence, help uh, wider public understanding of what additional responsibilities uh, the Scottish Government have taken on. And you know, I see it, it's one of the reasons uh, I'm appearing before the committee today is I am very keen to help that wider understanding and get that message across. What more do you think will be done to, to try and improve that? I mean, the, the, the public statements from the, the Joint Exchequer Committee are pretty minimal. Yes, well, I think that now we have the income tax outturn that I think it, now that the Scottish Government have set different rates of income tax, I think that you know, that is becoming clearer to people. Uh, I'm very happy to work with the committee uh, if you feel there's any more information uh, that we could put out there or indeed suggest some clearer formats. It's inherently quite a complicated issue. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for making it more clear. And I mean, I don't know, Lindsay, if you've got any thoughts on work, work we're doing to communicate it better. See when, see when you're doing that, Lindsay, go and explain to us how the Barnett formula works at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> So we are publishing a lot of uh, a lot of information. So we publish um, annual reports on both governments publish annual reports on the implementation of uh, both the Scotland Act 2012 and uh, 2016. We also supplement that with um, a UK government publication looking at the block grant adjustments. And there's a Scottish Government publication which then brings that together with Scottish Government receipts. And of course, the Scottish Government is, is best placed to explain that whole picture because they have both sides of the, um, of the ledger, as it, as it were. And we, um, from the Treasury and, and HMRC, work very closely with Scottish Government officials in providing the right information mm -hmm. and continually, continually reviewing what information is, mm -hmm. is helpful and included in, in all of those reports. But it's certainly something I'm... Mm happy to take up with the Scottish Government is how do we jointly communicate these changes better uh, to the wider public. I think that could be extremely helpful. I would, I would just finally make the, the case that perhaps this should be on the agenda earlier rather than later, a discussion between the governments and a discussion with the parliamentary committees as well about the way in which the, the, the future review should happen. You've mentioned the Smith Commission on a number of occasions and I would make the case that that guddle of a process, working behind closed doors and on a breakneck timescale, is absolutely a, a brilliant model of everything not to do when it comes uh, to, to reviewing the operation of the framework in future. Especially the closer we get to an election period in, in Scotland, the more difficult it will be to get a, a calm, cool look at these issues. So mm -hmm. I, I would suggest uh, getting agreement on an open, collaborative and publicly participative process sooner rather than later. Well, thank you. I hear what you say. Angela, I think you still had a supplementary you wanted to pick up on from earlier another question. Um, my, my apologies, convener. I've maybe missed this in the paper or in the, the presentation by the, the Chief uh, Secretary to the Treasury this morning, but um, is, is, do we have a timing for the review of the operation? of the fiscal framework as opposed, I, I, I think I heard you correctly when you said it will be reviewed in due course. Uh, we do have timing, yes. Okay. So, so the, the Smith Commission set out the timing um, uh, and said the review will be informed by an independent report with recommendations presented to both governments by the end of 2021. Okay, so um, in, in terms of compiling an independent uh, report, um, how do you envisage uh, both the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, you know, working together to agree, agree that independent process? As I've said at the moment, you know, we're in 2018, we're focusing on implementation of the fiscal framework. I think once that is completed, then we would work on the process of the review. Uh, yes, but uh, w winter is coming, it might be 2018, but 2020, is, you know, won't be that uh, far um, away and it would be good convener if um, 
you know, that, uh, that issues of process, um, you know, were agreed early so that there was uh, confidence and transparency um, all round uh, in that process and that the, the review was actually there for, you know, focusing on the substantive issues uh, of the day, whatever they may be, uh, as opposed to arguments um, about process or guddling about with process, you know, late in the day. I'll take those comments on board. Thank you. Well, from some of the stuff we learned yesterday and the, some of the areas that probably need to look, be looked at in that review, the committee had yesterday about the potential impact of demographic change on the size of the Scottish income tax base, in particular the issue around, related, um, about the relative size of the working age population in Scotland. Uh, sorry, the working age population in both the UK and Scotland, because obviously the working age, the Scotland's demographics are different to the rest of the UK and our, our population, population um, share is ageing is aging quicker. Um, so I, I wonder if you would recognise that that might be something that needs to be done as part of that review. We look at that demographic impact and what, uh, and, and probably in the light of whatever type of Brexit we have as well, um, because obviously some of the information we had yesterday showed quite clearly the Scottish economy was dependent upon that EU migrant workforce to, to help feed our tax base. So I think it's something we need to look at as we get into that review period. I wonder if you would agree with that. So I make two comments. First of all, the agreement for the fiscal framework is the adjustment by index per capita for Scotland, which does protect against population decreased risk, although clearly the Scottish Government wouldn't get the benefits of population increase. So that is significantly different from the comparable methodology which is in place for Wales. Yeah, that, so that, that, that's an, an overall population process. Yeah, so but I'm, not, I'm just pointing out yeah. that compared to other yeah. uh, fiscal frameworks we've got in place, the Scottish Government is protected against population size risk. Uh, just on, by, on the point about demographics, the, or rel relative to the tax take in both countries, on the, on the point about demographics, it, the Scottish Government does have levers to influence uh, the demographics of Scotland. Uh, and so I don't think it's entirely sort of exogenous to Scotland, uh, the, the, the population shape. So I talked earlier about broader policies to attract business to Scotland, whether those are planning and development policies, housing policies, skills policies. So I think to say that all of those policies are simply exogenous to the Scottish Government isn't, isn't a fair reflection. Now, those issues, of course, were all debated during the process of the Smith Commission, and what you're suggesting, convener, is those issues should be further debated. I would suggest we need to see the outturns more clearly and the impact of tax devolution before considering what might be discussed in the review. And I think we've got a, you know, a few more years to go before we see that. We are in very early days of it. Yeah, I, I, I'm the first to recognise that the powers that Scottish Government have in terms of the overall economy are there for us to use, but that might not necessarily help in dealing with that age-related problem. And it's that specific issue which I was uh, trying to address in terms of... You, you mentioned migration. Of course, the report from the Migration Advisory Committee was very clear in not recommending a separate migration policy for Scotland. And indeed, that was also confirmed by the director of the CBI who suggested that would not be helpful from the perspective of Scottish business. Yeah, I would argue for that, but I wasn't making that point. No. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is we, that, uh, and the, the current system looks at the overall population base. It doesn't disaggregate it down to the age issue. Mm. And I think that's, that's the issue specifically I'm asking Treasury to look at. But, okay. I'm not getting anywhere with that one either. Uh, Murdo, maybe I'm not... There's time I have a separate issue to Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. Um, the Scottish Government, in its budget for the current year, changed 
a number of the, the tax bans and, and, and tax rates. And one of the impacts of that was that the, the basic rate of tax now applies over a narrower range of incomes compared to the UK basic rate. And there were some consequences um, from that in relation to um, access to allowances, such as the married couples allowance, and also the question of um, certain tax reliefs, including pensions tax relief. Now, I know Treasury has worked to try and uh, make adjustments at a UK level to try and uh, ensure there's no detriment or additional benefit to Scottish taxpayers as a result of um, Scottish government decisions on the budget. And I'm wondering if you're aware, have all these issues now been resolved, as far as you're aware, arising from the current year's budget? I believe they have. Yes, I believe they have, and been legislated for. Yeah, okay, okay. And uh, it, it, projecting ahead, if, if, if the Scottish Government in, in a future budget were able to, was going to make similar changes that might affect allowances, would the, would the Treasury be similarly minded to be helpful in terms of making further adjustments? <laughs> well, the Treasury always likes to be helpful, <laughs> but I can't make any promises, Murdo, and we've got to look at the overall budgetary implications of that. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, Chief Secretary, and I'm very grateful for you give it, coming along to answer some of our questions in the fiscal framework this morning. Uh, I now close this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee.